There are aspects of the Lord Jesus Christ and of God's intention that I want to introduce to you. And I hope that the Holy Spirit will, will give me utterance. If you want to put a title on this, here's what it would be. Living in the presence of the future. Has Jesus Christ changed? In the Christian faith, there have been two traditions that have competed against one another for centuries. The first one is what theologians call the Jesus of history. And what does that mean? It means that there have been groups of Christians throughout the ages, they're living in our day also, who have focused their attention on the Gospels and what Jesus did during his earthly ministry. And I will say this, many of those groups have done a lot of good in this world. A lot of good. They've helped a lot of people. The problem is that in many cases, they have made helping people and doing good things the equivalent of salvation. And, by and large, they have done those things in the power of their own strength and their own flesh. In other words, they came to the Gospels and said, look what Jesus did, let's go ahead and do it. We're going to imitate Jesus, we're going to copy Jesus, but they're doing it in the power and energy of the soul in the human life. Okay, That's one tradition focusing on the Jesus of history. The other tradition is what theologians call the Christ of faith. And this refers to groups who have focused on the indwelling Lord, the post-resurrected Christ, and have given attention to the internal relationship that we have with a Jesus who is alive and He lives in us. And we live by His life. And we know Him now in the Spirit. And it's a beautiful emphasis. And this has produced groups that have a very strong devotional life. Groups that are afraid of the flesh. So much so that they're afraid to do anything. Because we don't want this to be the flesh. We don't want to eat from the wrong tree. We want to live by the Lord's life. And sometimes it's caused groups that have basically dismissed the Jesus of history. And said, we really can't find anything out here. There's nothing here for us to learn. That was Jesus then. We live by the Christ of faith. And oftentimes, this tradition can be found in groups that become very ingrown, very insular, beautiful devotional life, but some of them have actually become sectarian. Okay, so we have these two traditions, the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. I want to announce in the beginning of this message, brothers and sisters, there is no difference between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. They are the same exact person. They're not two different people. They're the same person. The Jesus that lives in you, the Christ that lives in you, the Christ whose life that is in you and me is the same person that walked the shores of Galilee. He's the same person. He's not changed. Whatever made his heart beat when he walked this earth still makes his heart beat now in you. Whatever made him upset and angry then makes him upset and angry now. Whatever makes his heart throb, whatever drives him now drove him then. He's not two different lords. He's the same Christ. I will quote Hebrews 13. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same person. Now that's important. It's important for a lot of reasons, but I just want that to settle in. When I open up the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of Luke, and I'm looking at this Jesus who lived in the first century, that's the same Lord that's inside me and inside you. That's the same Lord that lives in the church. That's an important point. Now, I'm going to raise three questions that I want you to hold on to in your mind. And during the course of tonight and tomorrow, I'm going to try to answer them. But I want them to just settle. The first question is this. If Jesus Christ was the Lord of the world, in other words, 
He was calling the shots. He was running the show of this earth. If he was the Lord of the world and his perfect will was being accomplished, what would the world look like? What would it look like? How would it look different than what it looks like today? If Jesus Christ was the Lord of the world and he was calling the shots and running the show and his will was being done. That's the first question. Now the second question gets a little closer to home. If Jesus Christ was Lord, was the Lord over Jacksonville, and he was calling the shots, and his will was being done in the city of Jacksonville, Florida, what would this city look like? And would it look any different than it does now? That's the second question. And the third question is this. If Jesus Christ was in the flesh today, he was walking around in his human body today. We brought him from the first century and we pulled him right here in our day. What would he be doing? What would he be doing? What would a week in the life of Jesus Christ on earth in the 21st century in the flesh look like? I've thought about this question before. Those are three questions, but I want to make a, a little comment on the last one. If you take the teaching and theology of some churches to its logical conclusion, you take their emphasis, their messages, to its logical conclusion, this is what Jesus would be doing for a whole week in our day. He would be visiting churches. He would stand in the middle of the room. The members of that church would worship him, would sing to him, would love him, would talk to one another about him, would talk to him about him. And then after that service was over and everyone went home, he would travel to church, sit in the center of the room, and everybody would worship him, love him, and praise him. And that would be his life for that week. <laughs> you don't know how many groups would fit into that. And if they were presented with that, I think and hope they would step back and say, hmm, maybe my view of Jesus Christ is, maybe it's just a little bit off, or maybe there's more. Or maybe I don't understand the whole picture. Okay, so those are the three questions. Now, I want to begin telling you a story. The story begins with God the Creator creating a world that He loves very much. Creating a creation that He loves very much. So much so that after it was created, He said, this is very good. And that story starts in Genesis and it ends in the book of Revelation. Now, something went wrong, terribly wrong with this world that he created. And it went wrong early on. And we have been taught, many of us Christians have been taught, that what God did when the earth went wrong and the world went wrong is he said, this nasty little world has rebelled against me, so I'm going to scrap it. I'm going to throw it into the circular file in the heavenlies. I'm going to get rid of it, and I'm going to choose a few people out of it and take them to heaven. Sisters and brothers, that's not the biblical story. God promised from very early on that he would lovingly restore the world. Not reject it, but restore it and transform it. And you can see this again and again and again in the Old Testament. The earth remains forever. You can read it in the Psalms, Psalm 78, Ecclesiastes 1. Over and over and over again, the earth will remain forever. God has said very good over his creation. Now, if you go back into the garden, you find something interesting. And that is when God created man and woman... He gave them a task, and it was, bear my image in the earth. Exercise my authority. And then he put him in the garden. Now, the garden is very interesting. In that garden, heaven, which is God's space and his dimension, and earth were interlocked, and they overlapped. That's what the garden was. It was an intersection between heaven and earth. The scripture says, and it doesn't expound on it, it's profoundly mysterious, but God walked in the garden and they heard his voice. 
Something was happening. This was an interlocking of heaven and earth. And when you go to the end of the story, what do you see? You see heaven, and where is it going? It's coming down to the earth. And so you have the same interlocking. This gives us a glimpse into God's loving intention. He has always wanted there to be an interlocking and overlapping between heaven and earth. And He's not going to destroy the earth in the sense that He's going to scrap it. He's going to transform it. He's going to restore it. He's going to set it right. Everything that went wrong, He will set it right. God, our God, our Creator, will set it right in the end. And heaven will come to the earth and they will be one again as they were in the garden. How is God going to restore the earth? How is He going to lovingly bring His creation back and set it right? and bring heaven to earth. He started with a man named Abraham. Now this to me is awesome. In Genesis 12, God calls this man Abraham, and He says to him, You and your family I have chosen. You will become a great nation. I will bless you. All the Pentecostals ought to say amen right there. I will bless you. And it gets even better. Whoever blesses you, I will bless. And whoever curses you, I will curse. But then he said this, and here is the clincher. This to me is the root of God's way of restoring the earth. He said, through you, through your seed, through the nation that comes through your loins, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Through you, the whole world will be blessed. Or if I can put it this way, through you, the whole world will be set right. Through you. So we have this promise. And you know what's interesting? If you read the Abrahamic promise in Genesis 12, it echoes God's command to Adam and Eve in the garden. Be fruitful and multiply. Take care of the land. This land is yours. It's the same thing to Abraham. He's repeating it, but he's doing it in the form of a promise. Now watch what happens. Abraham's seed is born. They become a nation, the nation of Israel. And God gives them His laws. Now, I want you to step back from everything you've heard about the law. You know, 613 laws, we've got to obey this. And look at it through different eyes. Those laws that God gave Israel, many of them reflected what it looks like when God runs the world. For example, the Lord said to Israel, If you lend money to someone, do not charge interest. He gave them the law of the tithe. And I'm not preaching tithing here. I want to show you the principle. You know what that tithe was for? It was for the orphans, the widows, and the stranger. Those outside of Israel. The stranger. He had this law. It's called the law of gleanings. When Israel would harvest their crops, they were not to harvest the corners because the Lord said that's for the stranger and the poor and the needy and then the gleanings those that are left behind leave them for the stranger the poor and the needy then he gave them the law of jubilee it's called the year of jubilee every 50 years every slave every person that was sold into slavery or that had to sell themselves in slavery was set free liberated Totally. Everyone that lost property, they or their descendants, they got the land back. And everyone that had debt, how many have debt? Okay. Clean. Swiped clean. No more debt. It gave everybody a fresh start. Everybody had a level playing field. Justice was done, but it was a forgiving justice. The people were forgiven. It was a statement against oppression. It was freedom, peace. They called it the year of the Lord's favor. And what God was saying to Israel was this, and I'm quoting Old Testament passages, you are the light of the world. You, Israel, are my servant. In this tiny strip of land that I have given Abraham, my will will run free course. And the whole world will see what the world looks like when I am running the show. Forgiveness, the poor are helped, there's justice, there's healing, there's joy. And here's what happened. 
Israel forgot her mission. And she took the promises that were given to her and distorted them. And she made them to become all about herself. She was to be the light of the world. And what she did is instead of putting windows around her so the light can shine out, she put mirrors around her so the light shone back on her. This is why the prophets, here's a crash course on the prophets, Amos, Isaiah, all those guys, the Lord is saying, I have made you to be a light to all the nations. Through you, all the nations would be blessed. Why are you using unjust weights and balances and exploiting one another? Why are you oppressing one another? Why are you taking my promises and pulling them to yourself? And why are you forgetting the reason why you exist was to be a blessing to all nations. See, what Israel had done is they had taken the first part of that Abrahamic promise, we will be a great nation. God will bless us. Whoever blesses us, God will bless. Whoever curses us, God will curse. And totally rejected, forgot, dismissed the last part, which is through you, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. They thought the whole show was for them. And they even got to the place, and this is true in the first century, where they despised all those who were outside of them and condemned them. They separated themselves from the world and condemned the world and God had called them to be a light to all the nations and through Israel all the nations were to be blessed. They perverted the mission of God. And it's a tragic story. And of course we just have to step back and say to ourselves, the body of Christ has never made that mistake. <laughs> has it? I'm summarizing very succinctly what happened, but the Lord kept repeating to Israel and reminding her what her mission was. And this was the environment, this was the situation in which Jesus Christ appears on the scene. And He comes to be the salvation of Israel, the Messiah, and to remind Israel what her place was in the world. You know the Sermon on the Mount? That, first and foremost, was not a message to the church. It was first and foremost a message to Israel. You are the light of the world. Don't hide your light. Let your light shine. Much of what he taught was to remind Israel of who she was. And of course, she rejected him. But interestingly enough, he called 12 disciples. And why did he call 12 disciples? Because there were 12 tribes of Israel. That was the embryo of the new Israel. That was the new Israel. And I'll just speed up ahead just a little bit. In Galatians, Paul says, you, the churches in Galatia, are the seed of Abraham. And God's promises are being fulfilled in you. What does that mean? Twelve disciples. And what does Jesus do? He enters into this situation and he makes an announcement. And it's this, the time has come, and it's now. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now, I don't know about you, but I was taught that the kingdom of God means heaven. Or some place. Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God again and again and again and again. In fact, you can count through the Gospels, he mentioned it over a hundred times. And if you ever look for this, it's just spilling out of his mouth. His message was the kingdom of God. I was taught it was heaven. It was a place. It was a location. Here's what it is first and foremost. It's an activity. And you know what it is? The kingdom of God is the reign of God. It's his rulership. And Jesus preached this kingdom. And I think we have really, many of us Christians have neglected this message. Yet, if you open up your New Testament, it just stares you in the face almost every page. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. What Jesus was saying is, God's reign that Israel was supposed to fulfill has now come in the earth. And it's come in my person. I am here. And I am bringing that kingdom which is from heaven into the earth. 
And what does the kingdom of God look like? What does it look like when God's running the show? Let me get back to that question. What does it look like when He's calling the shots? Well, Jesus did what the New Testament calls the signs of the kingdom. Step back and ask yourself the question, what did He do when He was on this earth? What did He really do? What was the heart of His three and a half year ministry? And I'll just offer some of the key points. One, He spent time with, hung out with, befriended sinners, the outcasts, the oppressed, the marginalized. You can find this throughout the Gospels. And he was severely persecuted for it. He was called the friend of sinners. He embraced people that were despised and no one wanted to have anything to do with. And some of them were oppressors. They were tax collectors. And he hung out with them. As one man said, he partied with sinners. Now, I don't particularly like that phrase. But he ate with them. And in the Jewish world, to break bread with somebody... That meant, I am being your friend. I receive you and I affirm you. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a Jew. He wasn't just a little man. He was a Jew and he was a tax collector. And not only was he a tax collector, he was the chief of tax collectors. Do you know that when he took that job, no Jew ever allowed him into their home and broke bread with them? That relationship was severed. He was hated and despised because he was part of the oppression now. Do you understand? And here he is looking at this person called Jesus who's walking in the town. He gets up in the tree. He's looking for him. And Jesus turns to this oppressing Jew who's betrayed his people and says, I am coming to your house to break bread with you. That's powerful. That means I don't care that you're despised, and you know what? You deserve it. But I am going to be your friend. And salvation came to his house. That's just one small example, but he hung out with these people. Not only did he do that, but he said this over and over again. The poor have the gospel preached to them. What's the gospel? It's the good news. When God is running the show, that's good news for the poor. God cares for the poor. And all throughout Israel, he took care of the poor. He made sure of it. When God's running the show, there's justice. When God's running the show, there's healing. When God's running the show, there's forgiveness of sins. And what is Jesus doing? He's forgiving sin, sometimes monumental sin. He's healing the sick. He's cleansing lepers who not only are sick, but they're ostracized. He's casting out demons. In some cases, he's raising the dead, especially the little girl who died. Can you imagine the trauma to the family? Strip all the miracles from the miraculous and ask the question, what is he doing in all of this? I'll tell you what he's doing. He's alleviating human suffering. He is alleviating human suffering. And how is he doing that? He is showing that the power from heaven, the other world, the new creation is breaking into the old creation through His works. That's what He's doing. He's showing that heaven is to come on earth. And in His ministry, that's what was happening. The will of heaven and the power of the future, God's future, when He will restore all things, was present in the ministry of Jesus and in the person of Jesus. The future was invading and breaking into the present world through His ministry. In Jesus Christ, if you are around Him, you are watching the presence of the future break into the present world. And remember what the future is. You can find this in Isaiah 11 and Habakkuk 2. The glory of the Lord will fill the earth just as the waters cover the seas and that's when the trees of the field will clap their hands. And that's when the lion and the wolf will lie together. There will be peace. There will be justice. The poor will be cared for. There will be no poverty. There will be healing. There will be forgiveness. There will be joy. That's the future. That's restoration. That's what God wants. Heaven and earth joined. And in Jesus' ministry, you see that. You see the future breaking into the present. And what is he doing? He's alleviating human suffering. And he's showing Israel what Israel was to be. 
And then he dies and he's crucified. And we all know what that is. So I don't have to repeat that and explain what that is. We all got that foundation, right? Amen. He rises again. And in the resurrection, he launches the new creation in the midst of the old creation. He launches the new creation in the midst of the old creation. Watch what happens in his resurrection. You see this in the last chapters of John. He brings the twelve disciples together. He brings the disciples together who represent the new Israel. And he says this, As the Father has sent me, I send you. As the Father has sent me into the world to show the world, what the kingdom of God is like when God's running the show. As the Father has sent me into the world to bring the power of heaven into the earth. As the Father has sent me to show Israel what she was to be, to be her Savior, to bring salvation to Israel. As the Father has sent me, so I send you into the world. And here's a very simple principle. What Jesus was to Israel, the church is to the world. See, brothers and sisters, we are called the new Israel. We're part of the new creation. And that new creation is wonderful. A bit of the future has penetrated this realm, this earth realm, and is now living on this earth. God's future has arrived in Jesus and now in the church. But the church isn't simply to rejoice in that new creation and take the light and put mirrors around it. The church is to be the light of the world. And through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And here's something else that happened when Jesus was raised from the dead. He was not only proven to be the Messiah of Israel. The resurrection proved that. He claimed it. People didn't believe it. But when he rose out of that grave, it was proven. It was fact. He is salvation for Israel. But not only that, he proved to be something else. He proved to be, and God proved this through the resurrection. Listen, the Lord of the whole world. All authority, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I am now Lord over the whole world. And the new creation understands that. But it's true. It's true. Now, the story picks up with the book of Acts. And listen to how Acts starts. Luke opens up the book of Acts and he says this. He's writing to some guy named Theophilus. He says, Theophilus, in the first book that I wrote you, which is the Gospel of Luke, I told you all about what Jesus began to do. Began to do. I told you all about what Jesus began to do. The implication now is, now in this book, which is the book of Acts, I'm telling you what Jesus Christ continued to do. Because He's alive. And where is He living? In the church. And it's the same Christ, brothers and sisters. He's not different. He didn't come out of the tomb and say, well, you know what? All the stuff that I did, just ignore it. What moved me then, forget about it. I'm a different person. And now, I'm only concerned with you who are mine. Of course, if you think about that, there was a time where in the natural, we weren't his, right? I mean, he brought us to himself. Think about that. All that... Jesus began to do, I said in the first book, so the book of Acts then becomes a record of what Jesus Christ continued to do through his church on earth. There's something else that we should notice about the book of Acts that I want to highlight. It begins with the discussion by Jesus with his disciples on the kingdom of God. They ask him about the kingdom of God. And if you go to the very last chapter, Paul is in Rome. And he is preaching the kingdom of God right on Caesar's doorstep. It comes right to Rome where Caesar, the emperor of the world, lives and he's preaching the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It is this, 
that Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified and is risen, is now Lord of the world and not Caesar. <laughs> Jesus is Lord and not Caesar. Jesus is Lord and not Mars. Jesus is Lord and not Aphrodite. Jesus is Lord. He's the new emperor. He's the new world leader. And brothers and sisters, listen to me. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. The gospel is not the world's sin. God hates the world. He's going to scrap it. Jesus came to the earth. He died for a few people. Whoever believes on Him will go to heaven. That's a result of the gospel. That's an aspect of the gospel. The gospel is this Jesus, this Jew in the natural, came to this earth as the Son of God, as the Messiah to Israel, and He was crucified, He destroyed the old creation on the cross, He rose again from the dead as the ruler of the world, and He is now Lord. He's the new emperor, He's the last emperor. And no other lords can trump Him. In fact, this gospel, listen to this, this explains all the persecution in the book of Acts. This explains why when this message was preached, there were riots after riots after riots breaking out everywhere. This is why Paul was imprisoned and persecuted. Because he had the audacity to stand up where Caesar's imprint was everywhere in those Roman towns and say, Caesar's not Lord anymore. Jesus of Nazareth is Lord. And now if you tell that to a poor person, and they understand who Jesus was and that God's new world is a world where there is justice and peace and the end of poverty and suffering. That's good news. That's good news to the poor. Amen. But if you're a ruler, there is a collision now. You are now challenging in Caesar's face and saying, you're not Lord anymore. And yet, this is what the church preached. This is what Paul preached. To put it in modern terms, Jesus is Lord, not Mars, the God of war. Jesus is Lord, not mammon, money. Jesus is Lord, not materialism. Jesus is Lord, not Aphrodite, the goddess of erotic sex. Jesus is Lord. And that calls to account all other powers on earth. And we're told in Ephesians that it is through the church that God's wisdom is made known to the principalities and powers. And that's when all hell breaks loose. All hell doesn't break loose when Christians are in their home worshiping Jesus. It does break loose when they open their mouth and say, Jesus is Lord, especially where earthly power is usurping the Lordship of Christ and violating it. And you will see Paul do this. He will speak to rulers and he will remind them and declare to them, Jesus of Nazareth is Lord. Just picture how outrageous this gospel was in that day. Paul walks into the city of Corinth. These are Greeks. They're pagans. At one time there was a thousand temple prostitutes in Corinth. Paul of Tarsus, a Jew, walks into this pagan world, this pagan town. And he goes into the marketplace and he stands up and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, I have an announcement. There is right now a new ruler of the whole world. Now, they're under Caesar, the Roman emperor. There is now a new ruler of the whole world. And he was born a Jew. He's from another world. In fact, he's the son of the God who created this earth. And he was crucified. Now, that was, that was outrageous to a Greek to have someone who was crucified to be anything purporting to have any power and he's been raised from the dead and this happened 20 years ago and now he's claiming your allegiance and you know what the amazing thing is there were some people who actually believed it that's the power of the gospel you know why because it's true it's true he is the Lord. And yes, He has saved us from our sins. And yes, He gives us eternal life. But boy, the Gospel is, this Jesus who was crucified and raised again is now Lord of the whole world. 
And then the question comes, what would the world look like if Jesus was Lord? And brothers and sisters, the church, part of the mission of the church is to announce, live out, embody, and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and that all other lords will come into account and their allegiance must bow to him. And whether they do or whether they don't, it doesn't matter. He's still Lord and that may bring persecution. And what does it look like? And what the church does on this earth and what they did in the book of Acts, and I will show this to you tomorrow, they were living in the presence of the future. They brought heaven onto earth in their little towns. What they did was they carried on the ministry of Jesus. And they not only declared the kingdom of God, but they showed what it looked like if God was running the show. They showed what it looked like. They revealed what the new creation was all about. You see, when God gave Abraham that promise and he gave him that little strip of land, that was to be the small pilot project of what the world would look like if God was in charge. Well, now that promise has been passed down to the church, we who are part of the new creation. And there is the presence of the future here in this room. And there is the power of the future here in this room. And Jesus is Lord. And that is our message. And brothers and sisters, God has a beautiful mission. He's going to restore the earth. And the beauty of this mission is we don't have to sit and wait <coughs> passively and celebrate what God has done for us. And we do that, praise the Lord, but we don't have to just do that. We can join Him in His grand mission and watch the kingdom of God pieces of the new creation penetrate this earth we can watch it transform people to me this is exciting the very reason why Jesus Christ has set us free the very reason why you ever ask that question why did he set me free why did he set me free from guilt condemnation the law religious duty did he do that so that I can celebrate Him and enjoy Him, even if it's with my brothers and sisters, and that's all? Or did He do that so that I can participate in His eternal purpose and His grand mission of bearing His image in the world? So that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Yes, I will make you a great nation. Praise the Lord. Yes, I will bless you, and whoever blesses you, I will bless. Praise the Lord. But join me in my purpose that my image will be seen on this earth and the new creation will penetrate the old creation. And in some mysterious way, and I don't know how this works out and I don't really care how it works out, but in some way that advances the final coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when His rulership will be enacted everywhere and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. In some way, the two are connected. Brothers and sisters, this is a big picture of part of God's eternal purpose. That the new creation has arrived in Jesus and it's now arrived in the church. And it's not just for us to revel and rejoice in amongst ourselves. It's to bring it into the city and into this world. Thank God you have been set free from religious guilt and duty and obligation because we don't have to do this in our flesh. That's what the Holy Spirit has come to do. You know, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of the future resurrection and the new creation in the future. The Holy Spirit, Paul says this, He's the guarantee that what you've been promised in the future is in fact a reality. That God's future where the glory of the Lord will fill the whole earth like the waters cover the seas is going to happen. Because you have the Spirit now. And through the Spirit, we taste of the powers of the age to come. We can live in the presence of the future. And it's not just for us. It's for this world that God loves. He hasn't given up on the world. He's going to bring heaven to the earth. And that's why the Lord said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we have been called, thank God, what a high calling to join in that mission. All of creation is growing for this. Oh yes. 
and I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. You can't help it, Greg. You get me sparked up. And wait a minute. Oh, listen, all oh, creation's groaning, right? In Romans 8, I'll just preview. Romans 8. Everything is in Romans 8. Everything. The Spirit, the indwelling Christ, the resurrection, the resurrection life, the new creation. And then he says, this whole earth is in travail. It's like a woman giving birth. She wishes to be set free from the corruption. Wow. And then he turns around and he says to the church, and the Spirit groans through you also. And they're connected. God is groaning for this world. And this world is groaning to be set free. And the Spirit, which is the indwelling Christ, which is God, is in us. And we can touch that hurt and that pain and that groaning. We can embrace it. And the Spirit will live through us. And He will do what He wishes to do through us, which will bear the image of God in the earth. And bearing the image of God is not just so I can see the image of God in you in this little room here. The image is for the world to see. And the message is Jesus is Lord. God will run the show and He's running the show among us. And we want to let you know the good news. He is Lord. Not going to be. He is Lord now. Open your eyes and see it. And give your allegiance to Him. The evangelical church has reduced the mission of God to my sin and my salvation. And yet we have a God who's burning out here with an intention, a loving intention to restore His world. And He has called us. He has brought us into this mission. This has nothing to do with human strength or effort because, saints, we can't do anything. Period. But we have the Spirit of God in us. We have Christ in us and He's the same Jesus. And His power is resident. And we've been called into this mission to show forth signs of that coming kingdom. Signs of that coming kingdom. So that this world and the people in it will look. I'll just tell you this. When the church has embraced the mission of God and His purpose in image bearing, people in the world will say, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? What's your motivation? And our answer is, we tell them about Jesus Christ. You are going to love the stories I'm going to read to you tomorrow of our forefathers in the first century. It's right in the New Testament under our nose. You know, If we don't have eyes to see, we don't see it. The second century, the third century, the fourth century, they were living in the presence of the future. And they were showing forth the inbreaking of the kingdom of God on earth. And they were showing forth what the new creation is all about. And brothers and sisters, that's part of why we're here. It's a big part of why we're here. Jesus, he walks into the synagogue, and it's his turn to speak. He's allowed to speak, and he opens up to the book of Isaiah. And apparently they would do readings every Sabbath. And when Jesus got up to speak this particular Sabbath, the pin of the scroll was placed right on this text, which he's going to read. And so he walks up, he opens the scroll, and he found the place where it was written. And this is what he said. And here is Jesus' mandate in a nutshell. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release, liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That's the year of Jubilee. Wow. And Jesus Christ was the Jubilee personified. And he closed the book. He gave it back to the attendant. He sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled wow. in your hearing. Wow. Now, brothers and sisters, that is the image-bearing mandate of the new creation. Luke 4.18, beautiful passage. And that's what he, that was a message he sent to John the Baptist. Yeah. Yes, yes Tell he did. Him this. Tell him this. Amen. To encourage him. 
Praise the Lord. If Jesus was on the earth now in the city of Jacksonville, I think what would happen is the sinners, the outcasts, the marginal, the poor, the needy would be incredibly attracted to him. The religious leaders, the bigots, the self-righteous, and those in power who are not willing to bow to his allegiance, those are the ones that would seek to put him to death. Just move over an inch and ask yourself, how are most Christians perceived by the world? We are religious fanatics, we're bigots, we're uncaring, we're self-righteous, we're lunatics, we, you know, we don't really care about people, we just want to push the message down their throat and bring them into our... Would to God that there would be Christians who are bearing the image of God in their community and living in the presence of the future. There are very, very few expressions like this. Do you remember when John said to him, Lord, they're casting out devils and they're not part of our denomination. Tell them to stop. (laughs) And he said, let them be. Whosoever is not against me is Mm -hmm. for me. Now that, to me, was an in-your-face rebuke to an elitist, sectarian, us-only spirit. And there is something of that message, that word that Jesus gave, that we need to to take hold of, I believe, that, that will please his heart. And when the early Christians spoke that gospel, that Jesus is Lord and not Caesar, to power... That's when the sparks flew. Mm. They did not pick up the sword. Their way of invoking the kingdom of God on the earth and expressing it was not through earthly power. It wasn't through the sword. It was by serving and loving and even going to the cross themselves. And that's the power of the cross. Mm. Jesus said to his disciples, you're not like the benefactors. You're not like those who lord it over, but the greatest will be servant of all. That's our sword is service and laying our life down and showing the image of God. And we do this in the power of the Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ. And He's still alive. He's the same Lord that walked in Galilee. Just look at His life and you will get in touch with this person. It will help you to know Him. That's the same Lord that lives in me and in the church. He's no different. He's the same Christ. That's what drove these Christians. It's what I always was wondering. What did they know in the first century that we're not getting? What is it? They didn't have a Bible. They didn't have all the things that we so-called have now. But they died for this. I mean, they saw something. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what they saw. Yeah. Yeah. They were being told those things by the apostles. 